It's the middle of August, which means over 75 million students are heading back to school. And this year, that looks a lot different. The coronavirus pandemic has completely disrupted our education system, with everything from Ivy League universities to public elementary schools struggling to balance effective teaching with public health and safety. Some schools have gone remote, while others are trying to safely teach in person. Many of those shutting down again after spikes in infection among students and teachers. All that against a backdrop of a social justice movement that has educators and advocates rethinking the way topics like slavery and civil rights are being taught around the country. So today, we're looking at the state of American education. Students and teachers adjusting to a new normal. As teachers, we're not going to give up. We're going to change our platform. We're going to change the way we teach. Activists challenging us to rethink difficult topics. History is uncomfortable. It should be. Because if we just accepted things as they are, nothing changes. And some incredible students that inspire us all. You can choose to be miserable and stay still, or you can be miserable and fight for a better tomorrow. And you just got to keep moving. And I promise you things will fall into place. Plus, a big crazy number you won't believe. This is More In Common. As schools scramble to reopen this fall, teachers are doing what they can to ensure their students learn safely. So we decided to check in with a few to see how they're coping with the new normal. As teachers, we're not gonna give up. We're gonna change our platform. We're gonna change the way we teach. All teachers are trying to find a way to continue to connect to students. We work way harder now than we did when we were at school. My name is Brian Deering. I am a eighth grade social studies teacher in Guthrie, Oklahoma. Being an educator, I think, is you know one of the most important jobs that we have in this country. Now on a normal day, I get up, school starts at eight, but I'm there at 6.15 in the morning, hanging out with kids you know, between classes, getting them ready to go, and then getting into class, going from bell to bell um, and teaching. This time, I don't know what I don't know what to expect. I mean, I ordered a helmet that's got an N95 and an N99 um, filter to it. It's a clear mask, goes all the way around, uh, and so I'll be the kids will be able to see my face. As for what the school's doing, we're implementing extra lunch periods, assigned seating, distancing in the hallways as much as possible, but we're not requiring masks. We got to follow the data, and data says wear a mask. I'm wearing a mask, and I hope everybody else does. Hi, my name is Austin Bohm. I'm a teacher teaching uh, middle grade kind of pod instruction um, to groups of students from ages 9 through 12. I personally have a chronic illness and so um, safety is the number one priority and is actually what led me to consider and to teach in a pod model in the first place. The first thing that's really great is we're able to do almost all of our work outside. Um, when we're working together, we do wear masks. In terms of collaboration, we always try to um, be hand sanitizing. And I felt very safe just because it's a much smaller number of students. I've just been absolutely blown away by uh, how resilient and how hardworking students have been um, in the new model of education that they've had to deal with. My name is Peter Wilson. I am a fourth grade teacher in Oakland, California. And we talked a lot about school starting, what it was going to look like, because, you know, we lost March, so those kids had a huge summer slide. It takes a lot to turn that face-to-face -face instruction to Zoom. I start my morning at 8.50. I open Zoom. Uh, lessons usually go about 30 minutes. And then they have a series of lessons that you know, we've set up to carry them throughout the day, but the brunt of the instruction is that first 35 to 40 minutes in the morning. I'm pretty much of a hands-on teacher, and I'm missing that in virtual learning. I think the biggest challenge is us knowing what's gonna happen day to day, and the kids are feeling the same thing. The media's painting this picture as, you know, the teachers don't know what to do. But yeah, we are teachers, we do know what to do. And we've been doing this for a long time. We just have to figure out how to make it work now. More in Common is all about celebrating diversity and inclusion. So when we heard that MIT had just elected its first black student body president, we knew we had to meet her. Hi, my name is Danielle Gathers. I'm a rising junior at MIT, and I'm the first black female student body president. The presidency! You claimed it! That's incredible! Congrats on the big victory! So we ran on unity, equity, and authenticity because we actually were sent home from COVID already. So we knew whoever people chose to vote for to be based on values. One, unity, making sure everyone kind of got that community feeling back. Two, equity, everyone being home and equity kind of goes crazy. So making sure that everyone's 
underrepresented voices are being heard by administrators and being amplified by student government. And then authenticity. I think historically our student government has kind of worked kind of quietly and not really said what they were doing from the transparency perspective. But we also wanted to be like, hey, we're people focused people. If you have a conversation with us, we're going to tell you the truth. What do you say to people who want to know kind of the value of student government? It takes a lot of work and effort to actually engage student communities, especially in a remote world. And so administrators don't have the time to do that. So I think it's really helpful to be able to engage with student leaders who have done the work and spent the time engaging community so we can really give them kind of a very centralized voice. What do you want young girls to know about kind of what it's like to jump a high school into a, kind of a school like MIT? I got deferred from MIT actually. Um, I was heartbroken. All my friends got in. I think people would like never think the president of the student body went through that. So I think in generally just understanding like the struggle to success and how your failures like will actually benefit you in the end and understanding that for women in general we're so underestimated that it's so important to know your self-worth and understand that you know your ambition and where you can get. Before we go to break, let's dive into the data. This week's big crazy number is one hour. Actually, a little less than one hour. That's how long each day the average student was spending in direct contact with teachers in May. That's compared to six hours per day when kids were at school before the pandemic. That astounding number comes from hundreds of thousands of American families surveyed by the U.S. Census Bureau who said that their kids got an average of 4.2 hours of direct contact with teachers every week. That's less than an hour a day. Now, some cities were better than others. Kids in New York were getting about 1.2 hours of teacher time a day. In Chicago, it was just over an hour, but in Detroit, it was only 45 minutes a day. And in the suburbs east of Los Angeles, it was just 36 minutes. That's a staggering decline in teaching time, one that can't help but have an impact on kids' learning. Think about how that change adds up. That means most kids are interacting with their teachers 25 less hours each week. It's more than 100 hours less of teaching time each month, month after month. So as society continues to adapt to life during the pandemic, let's hope schools and teachers can do so as well. When we come back, we'll look into a day in the life of students heading back to school. Hi, my name is Ben and I'm starting fifth grade. And later, an inspiring story you have to see to believe. I just don't think I would have ever had the chance to make it to Harvard Law, so this is just really amazing for me. Hi, my name is Ben and I'm starting fifth grade. Today is my first day of school. In the morning, my dad drove me to school. What do you need there? Your lunchbox? Your water bottle? Overall, I think I'm actually kind of excited to get for school this year. In class, might be more spaced out. Lunch might be different. Every morning, you take a temperature check, and right before lunch, you take a temperature check. Ben's getting out now and going over for his temperature check. Then we just had a feeling that it was going to be different. It's just so new. Because they're six feet apart, we wear masks all day, and we take a lot of hand sanitizer breaks. This is a class change. We tried to stay far away to make it as safe as possible. The biggest difference between this year and last year is um, separating the desks, lunch in the classrooms. We're just trying to make it like more clean. Brain break. This is a little break in the day to Give brain a break. We took math, we took language arts, writing, I took music, Spanish. After I finished my last class, my mom picks me up and brings me home. The biggest emotion I felt was probably being confused. It just didn't feel normal. But it was good to see my teachers and stuff. The social justice movement sparked by the Black Lives Matter protests goes well beyond police reforms. Now educators are rethinking the way they teach the history of black Americans. Whoever teaches history controls narrative. I didn't know how influential Texas was when it came to textbooks. Texas, California, and Florida play heavily into the publishing of textbooks because they're the largest publisher. So what these companies do is they'll go to Texas and Florida and say, what do you guys want us to include? 
and then they'll kind of sell those versions to every other state because these two states are their largest purchaser. Makes sense economically is horrible when it comes to historical accuracy or historical understanding. The one Texas textbook wanted to change the word slaves to workers. That stuff is so deceptive. But little adjustments like that shape narratives. It doesn't mean it shouldn't be discussed because it makes me uncomfortable. That means it should be discussed. So many figures who I feel like should have chapters in our textbook. So, so many women who've contributed. We celebrate Betsy Ross, who probably didn't sew the American flag. There's no proof of that. But we don't celebrate Deborah Sampson, a woman who dressed up as a man to fight in the American Revolution, served for two years, removed her own bullets until she, she got caught because she almost died. She had disguised herself as a man. For in her day, this was the only way she could serve in the army. New Jersey became the first state to actually make it mandatory to teach black history in all grades. I just assumed that was a thing. I, mean, I started teaching high school. I then came to the understanding that I teach straight, white, male Christian history to minority students, girls, and LGBTQ students. Textbooks, I had my students break it down. For every nine white Christian men, we mention one woman and one minority. White people need to learn, learn about black history. Jack Johnson, to me, is the most significant black athlete in history, more so than Jackie Robinson. He was the first heavyweight champion in a sport that was dominated by white culture. When he won the championship in 1908, a black man holds that title. It led to race wars throughout the country. We don't talk about him. Paul Robeson, I'm from New Jersey, and he was the first black actor on Broadway to play Othello and not be a white actor in blackface. He's left out of textbooks because he was considered a communist because he spoke out against the American government. Growing up, if I learned more about black history, more about women's history, more about the LGBT community, it wouldn't have made me feel inferior. It would make me realize that everyone contributed. I've been teaching about the Tulsa race riots for 10 years. Now people are just learning about it. I've been teaching about Juneteenth. Talking about it doesn't undermine Independence Day, but it's the reality of it. History is uncomfortable, it should be, because if we just accepted things as they are, nothing changes. We've taught white history for so so long that when we actually talk about teaching other groups history, they consider it politically correct. The more education a student receives, proper education, the more open-minded they are. When we come back. I mean, my dad always just told me life isn't going to be fair to anybody, but you can choose to be miserable and stay still, or you can be miserable and fight for a better tomorrow. And later, we're celebrating the political process. People will see me and will be like, isn't she too young? But it's fun because I get to see everything that's going on with politics and I get to see other people's perspectives. Rahan Stanton worked as a trash collector to pay for college. Now, he's heading off to Harvard Law School. I just don't think I would have ever had the chance to make it to Harvard Law, so this is just really amazing for me. To talk about the moment uh, you realized you'd been admitted. Literally, like, my whole world stopped. It's like all the sacrifices my dad made, you know, working three jobs, suffering a stroke, my brother dropping out of school so I could go to school. My mom left when I was eight, and, you know, my dad ended up losing his job not too long afterwards. And literally, he gave up his entire social life just to give my brother and I everything that he could. Look, I, I come out of high school. I get denied by every single college that I applied to. So I go work for the sanitation company. And then, you know, I'm over there cleaning dumpsters every day because that was my primary job. I would wake up around 4 a.m., then I would clean dumpsters. And I'll do that till about 8 a.m. to 9 a.m., depending on the day. I'll go to school, finish school, go back to cleaning dumpsters, or I'll go and haul trash if they missed the route and needed extra hands. And then I'll go from the, there to the library or my room to study, depending how tired I was. I want to say it was hard to some degree, but at the same time, I was so motivated to make my dad proud, make sure that sacrifice wasn't in vain, that it didn't feel that bad in the moment. Yeah, and, and talk about just the, the, the challenge. I, I tried to take the, the LSAT and got creamed on it. I went to Harvard undergrad, but there's no way I could go to Harvard Law School. Literally, the only reason why I got through it was because I had a supportive system behind me. All of the people I worked with were formerly incarcerated, you know, and also sanitation workers. They were the first people to ever really come around me as a community and say, hey, why are you here? Go strive for something better. That's amazing. That the, that your coworkers rallied behind you, saying, "Hey, you know, you got, you can make steps." What's your advice to so many right now who are out of work and, and looking for their next thing? I mean, my dad always just told me life isn't going to be fair to anybody, but you can choose to be miserable and stay still, or you can be miserable and fight for a better tomorrow. To keep it pushing, and even look for support, even in the place that you may not think it's at, because you're never alone, and you just got to keep moving. And I promise you things will fall into place. 
And what was the reaction of all those people who are around you for this? The, the people who I used to work with, they jumped for joy. When I think back about the people who helped me along this way, you know, everyone keeps saying, you know, how I made it into Harvard. Matter of fact, some people call me self-made. However, I think that's so foolish because I don't feel as though I made it to Harvard. I feel as though we made it to Harvard because all of my accomplishments are an extension of the investment they put into me. And that's something I couldn't pay back in 10 lifetimes. With the presidential election just 10 weeks away, More in Common is telling stories that celebrate our democracy. I feel like people see me and they're like, oh, she's a little young, but I've campaigned for Alexander Casio Cortez. I've campaigned for Alan Omar. I've campaigned for Rashida Tlaib. It's just like mostly people that I agree with. Hi, I'm Ana Lopez Alcantar. I am the 40th Ward's Deputy Committee woman. Anna found me uh, at the beginning of 2019 when I ran for alderman. And so when I decided to run for committee person, she was one of the first people to come and step up and come knock on doors with me again and, and talk to neighbors. Uh, Anna is truly an inspiration for our future generation of voters. People will see me and will be like, isn't she too young? But it's fun because I get to see everything that's going on with politics and I get to see other people's perspectives. Seeing like adults, they'll, like their reactions, and they'll be like, how old are you? And I'm like, oh, I'm 14. They'll be like, you're 14? I'm like, yeah, I know many teachers, teenagers don't care about politics, but here I am standing right in front of you caring about politics and my future. Committee people make sure that we have fair and accessible elections in our community, making sure that we have polling places that are safe uh, for people to vote. Even if there wasn't a virus, we should teach people different ways how to vote. It'll show people how to vote, like if they have like any situation. Her issues are different than maybe mine or our older generation of voters. But when we're voting now, we are making sure that she and younger generations have the opportunity to vote because what we vote on now is what impacts our younger people. I feel like there's definitely people who don't belong in Congress because they don't represent what I believe in. So having me like telling my friends about things that I believe in and making them form their own opinions at a young age will help them. You know, if we can prime young people to become sports stars or musicians, doctors, nurses, you know, people that you know we look up to, we should be priming young people to become public servants as well. When we come back, I'm calling this kind of the renaissance of the gap year. Gap year, especially right after high school, really enables you to explore what you want to do. And later, I was a teacher assistant from freshman year. And ever since I hit junior year, I wanted to expand my, my share and my knowledge to other people, not even from my school, but outside of school. Radical 2 equals radical 2x. We define a gap year as a semester or year of experiential learning typically taken after high school or before college or, or career in order to deepen one's practical, personal, and professional awareness. I'm calling this kind of the renaissance of the gap year. It's a great opportunity and a great time. Some colleges are actually trying to thin their campus in order to make it easier to do social distancing. San Francisco State University normally has, I think, 20 or 30,000 students on campus. They are never going to have more than 1,000 students on campus at the same time. As a college announces they're gonna go online, our gap year consultants and our gap year providers have an, like an immediate uptick in terms of the interest. We have some data to show that students who take a gap year, if they do it intentionally with some degree of purpose, they're actually back in school to the tune of 90% within a year. Because in some ways, like who knows what the economy is gonna look like on the other end of this. You take a year to let things normalize a little bit before pursuing a career in college, it might be really smart. I think a gap year is one of the fastest ways to find a path of purpose. Gap year, especially right after high school, really enables you to explore what you want to do. So I've been working on my nonprofit supply crate to secure PPE for those who need it. So with these games that we create, basically whenever people play these games and look at the ads, it generates us um, small bits of revenue. The same thing goes for mining cryptocurrency. So whenever you click start, it uses the CPU on your computer. And so we're mining some smaller cryptocurrencies and this way we can generate more from the limited CPU we have. 
And so, yeah, that's pretty much how it generates. And as for where the funds go, as someone who does a lot of programming, learning online shouldn't be that much of an issue. However, when I realized when it comes to other academic subjects that physical presence makes a big impact, a lot of campuses have like really strict rules. Like I, I can't go to the gym, I can't go to the library, I can't go to a different dorm and stuff like that. So that just makes the experience a lot worse. And through my gap year, and because I have a lot more time, I want to really dive into like what these colleges can offer. Is this a college that I really want to go to and kind of just finalize that and also be able to reapply to these colleges with everything going on like gap year honestly is the best thing to do. While a lot of students are learning on Zoom and Google Classrooms, we found one student taking his lessons to TikTok. Hi, my name is Alexis Oliveras. I'm 16 years old and I've been making math videos on TikTok. Well, two equals radical two X. And so before we even go to the next step, I was a teacher assistant from freshman year. And ever since I hit junior year, I wanted to expand my, my share and my knowledge to other people, not even from my school, but outside of school. When I first started making TikTok videos, I didn't know how far it would reach. Like I thought it would just be like in my area, New York City. But knowing that I saw people texting me from, oh, like they were from California or like all, all these other states just blew my mind because I was like, oh, it's, it's everywhere now. It's not like even from New York. I asked my teacher like, oh, can I get like a room so I can do these? And she said, yeah, sure. Students with students, like, you know, they could connect more with each other compared to like, you know, a student to a teacher. And the language as well, like the, the language between a student and a student can be like different compared to the language of a student and teacher. Cosine B, that is the same thing as asking what's the cosine of B. Because of similarity, that means that angle B and the angle E must be congruent. I, I mean, coming from me as well, I have struggled with math as well. Like, um, you know, not everyone, nobody is like, you know, perfect when it comes to like, you know, learning something new. So I would say there's many resources out there for you to go to. And what is the exterior angle? Well, basically that is the sum between the two non-adjacent interior angles will give us our X value. Everyone is different and everyone understands things differently. So for me, it's, it doesn't bother me what like videos I make because like, you know, everyone will find it useful. Even now it's just add 74 plus 23 to get our x value right here so what is 74 plus 23 well that is going to be 97 so therefore our answer for x is 97 let me know what you guys want to see next in the comments below and i hope you guys enjoyed this video thanks so much for watching our show today and remembering we have more in common than we think i'm michael koenigs you can find more of this show on the abc localish network